February 1807, Jane Austen wrote that she would plant Syringa for the sake of Cooper's line. And while I can give you that line right now, which just goes, Syringa, Ivory Pure, doesn't really seem like enough. But what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is think a bit about what the sake of Cooper and his line might be. Now, in some sense, of course, it, it simply means in remembrance of Cooper. But I want to think a little bit about what Cooper and his line might stand for, or stand in for, and about why that might be so appealing, not just to Austin, but in fact to other women writers of the late 18th century, and perhaps also to some of his more modern readers. What I'm going to suggest, and this can only be the sketchiest of sketches, is that part of Cooper's appeal is that his poetic landscapes, large and small, offer a sophisticated model of emotional expression and curtailment. Now, one of the things for which Cooper is famous, in gardening circles at least, is his attack on Capability Brown and on the kind of large-scale landscape gardens that Brown popularised in the second half of the 18th century. If we turn to a much-quoted passage from his major poem, The Task, we can see this kind of criticism in action. I'll talk you through it, but I'm also going to suggest that for all the rhetoric here, the attack on Brown is not everything Cooper thinks or feels about gardens, or even about landscape gardens. Let's look at the passage I have in mind, though, which is from the task, book three, and which introduces Lancelot Brown as the omnipotent magician. So it goes like this, lo he comes, the omnipotent magician Brown appears, down falls the venerable pile, the abode of our forefathers, a grave, whiskered race, but tasteless, springs a palace in its stead, but in a distant spot, where, more exposed, it may enjoy the advantage of the north and aguish east, till time shall have transformed those naked acres to a sheltering grove. He speaks, the lake in front becomes a lawn, woods vanish, hills subside and valleys rise, and streams, as if created for his use, pursue the track of his directing wand, sinuous or straight, now rapid and now slow, now murmuring soft, now roaring in cascades, even as he bids. The enraptured owner smiles, tis finished, and yet, finished as it seems, still wants a grace, the loveliest it could show, a mind to satisfy the enormous cost. Now, of course, if Brown's improvements are damned as almost impious, this kind of landscaping destroys the old established social system, symbolised by the country house, and while claiming godlike powers, alters the face of the earth until it becomes an image only of empty, useless display, the product finally of corruption and vice. Now, strikingly, of course, what Cooper also offers us in these lines is a kind of parody of the creation, and it implies a parodic effect in Brown's designs. And in fact, as the poem continues, we find the beauties of taste, the grace of design, degenerate into the beauties of commerce. And commerce, as a creature of the city, is, is equated with corruption and vice. Recalling a time when mansions once knew their own masters, Cooper instead finds that now the legitimate and rightful lord is but a transient guest, newly arrived and soon to be supplanted. Estates are landscapes, gazed upon a while, then advertised and auctioneered away. So Cooper seems to challenge the kind of overweening pride of, of those who create landscape gardens. And more than that, he goes on to ask if it's not instead the humble kitchen garden that is more significant to man, more virtuous because more useful, and less dangerous because less seductive to the Christian soul. Again, in Book 3 of the Task, Cooper claims that it's this garden, the kitchen garden, that is an integral part of domestic happiness, itself the only bliss of paradise that has survived the fall. The kitchen garden, not the landscape garden, is a means of creating order in the fallen world. Some flowers clothe the soil that feeds them, far diffused and lowly creeping, modest and yet fair, like virtue, 
thriving most where little seen, while weeds, like the multitude made faction mad, disturb good order and degrade true worth. Well, so far so good or bad, and the act of vegetable gardening, with its easy labour and its overt creation of order, seems to demonstrate for Cooper a proper understanding of the natural world. The kitchen garden reflects in small the order beyond itself. The problem though, and I think the attraction too, is that Cooper is far smarter and more troubled than this kind of easy platitude allows. If he's the first to recognise that the very gardens he damns those landscape gardens of the great are attractive. He sees in them too that they provide the seclusion and safety he knew was so necessary to a mind often quite deeply troubled by bouts of depression. And what really stands out in Cooper's writing about gardens, I think, is a much more subtle and sophisticated recognition that gardens, whether large or small, can focus the mind and enable an intensity of emotional reflection unlike any other. So that, rather than simply claiming that one kind of garden is good and another bad, Cooper insists on all gardens as spaces in which we're invited to dramatise and rehearse conflicting emotional and spiritual desires. We see this more ambivalent attitude to designed landscape when Cooper offers a, a eulogy on old-fashioned avenues. In book one of the task, it's this feature, the avenue, again of course characteristic of a large-scale landscape design, that offers Cooper a moment of both religious and sensual pleasure. And he writes, how airy and how light the graceful arch yet awful as the consecrated roof re-echoing pious anthems, while beneath the chequered earth seems restless as a flood brushed by the wind. So sportive is the light, shot through the boughs, it dances as they dance, shadow and sunlight intermingling quick, and darkening and enlightening as the leaves play wanton, every moment, every spot. can see the kind of delight in those kinds of moments, but it's in another of Cooper's poems, The Shrubbery, written in, in a time of affliction from poem 1782, that Cooper perhaps most insistently explores the contradictory pleasures and dangers of gardens. In The Shrubbery, the poem, Cooper offers a dual vision of that most intimate of garden spaces. One the elusive world of Miltonic melancholy and pious reverie, the other a reiteration of melancholic low spirits made worse by the knowledge of a pleasurable but absent alternative. And here he writes this, O oh, happy shades to me unblessed, friendly to peace but not to me, how ill the scene that offers rest and heart that cannot rest agree. The saint or moralist should tread this moss-grown alley, musing slow. They, saints and moralists, seek like me the secret shade, but not like me to nourish woe. Me, fruitful scenes and prospect waste, alike admonish not to roam. These, fruitful scenes, tell me of enjoyments past, and those, prospect waste of sorrows yet to come. Now this dramatising of alternative but coexisting states of pleasure felt by its absence is characteristic I think of Cooper's uncertainty about retirement but characteristic also of a much larger tradition of writing about melancholy, retirement and indeed depression. A tradition articulated not least in the letters of a number of women writing from and of the country. Again, I've only got room to give you one of the briefest examples, but in the summer of 1783, Elizabeth Carter wrote to her friend Elizabeth Montague of her own small garden's failure to lift her out of depression. 
And she writes, I'm still very low and spiritless, but hope to get about the world again in a few days. My poor little garden droops for the assistance of its mistress, one of whose great delights it is. And all my goods and chattels are in a litter and confusion very grievous to the orderly spirit of an ancient gentlewoman. That mirroring of the garden and the mind finds its echo, of course, in Cooper. And as in Cooper's poem, it registers the failure of the garden to lift the spirits when they are low. It also reiterates for us that other aspect of the melancholic garden, which we find in Cooper, its close association with guilt, shame and longing. And it's the last of those, longing, that I'm going to make the last of my points. Because Cooper's shrubbery offers us a moment of spiritual and emotional interaction, to be sure, but it also offers longing and loss. And it's worth thinking about that in relation to that passage about the syringa which Austin so admired. In that passage from the task, which led Austin to write of her new garden, I could not do without a syringa for the sake of Cooper's line, Cooper walks through a winter landscape, imagining flowers that will reappear in spring but are now covered in snow. Describing first laburnum rich in streaming gold, syringa ivory pure, along with the jasmine throwing wide her elegant sweets, the deep dark green of whose unvarnished leaf makes more conspicuous and illumines more the bright profusion of her scattered stars. He then continues like this, these have been and these shall be in their day and all this uniform uncoloured scene the snow shall be dismantled of its fleecy load and flush into variety again. From dearth to plenty and from death to life is nature's progress when she lectures man in heavenly truth evincing as she makes the grand transition that there lives and works a soul in all things and that soul is God. Now in passages like this the garden is not so much a physical location as a state of mind an imagining of oneself in time and in relation to perspectives beyond one's own, whatever one's beliefs. All of this, I think, may be embodied in what Austin imagines for the sake of Cooper's line and may go some way to explaining why one plant and one writer, Cooper, might matter so very much to her. <laughs> 